Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorf, a staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine. Hi, I'm Phoebe maltz Bovey. I blog at whatwouldphoebedo.blogspot.com. And we're going to start today by talking about a subject you've covered a bunch on your blog, parental overshare. And this comes up most recently because Molly Ringwald, the star or one of the stars of The Breakfast Club, an old 80s movie, was recently on an episode of This American Life. And basically she was confronting the fact of having a 10-year-old daughter whose friends had seen this movie and wanted to see the movie herself and wanted to see it with her mom. And her mom thought, eh, maybe she's a little too young, but you know, uh, the other kids in the class are talking about it. I'm kind of forced into watching it with her. And so they had a kind of mother-daughter bonding experience. And it would have been a very nice story, except for the fact that she had a tape recorder with her and she recorded the whole thing for a national radio audience. And uh, so is this a, an example of parental overshare, of a parent kind of uh, taking in their own hands a decision that's going to affect their kid down the line for the rest of their lives with this kind of archive of this private childhood moment um, for everyone to see? Uh, or, or on the other hand, is this okay? Because, you know, it's a 10-year-old kid and she comes off as a likable 10 year old in this interview. It's not something that's going to be held over her head or, or prevent her from getting a job, presumably. Uh, so what do you think about this? Um, well, I thought this was a prime example of parental overshare, um, especially just this aspect of a very sort of cringe inducing moment that was, um, so just to explain what the situation was, there was a whole discussion first of whether the girl um, knew the facts of life yet, and this was somehow broadcast on the radio. And then there was a part where the where Molly Ringwald's daughter started crying, something to do with her parents helping her too much with her homework or something sort of an ordinary child situation. But why was she crying on the radio? Why is she going to want to hear that? And it just seemed like it would be... Um, a perfectly normal moment that would just be very embarrassing if you were the one having that moment and if it were so public. Now, do you think that this, do, do you think that these moments where she, um, like where she was crying on the radio and where she was telling her mom that sometimes uh, she does feel like her mom pressures her to get good grades at right. school and she, and she doesn't uh, necessarily like that. Um, I think that these would definitely be embarrassing moments if you were a 10 year old and you were listening to it on the radio with your 10 year old friends, right? Like if you were at a sleepover and someone had a laptop and they pulled up This American Life and started playing it, you could see how they would make fun of you for this. Um, right. But do you think that it's an embarrassing moment uh, if someone digs it up in high school or college uh, or, or just to have online when this person grows up and is an adult? I think it's just incredibly personal in the sense that it it would bring up a lot of feelings she probably had to do with her mother and would probably create new ones. And I think it would more change the parent-child relationship than anything else. I think that's sort of where the violation lies if somebody finds something like this as an adult. Um, it's more that you would just wonder why why did your parent think to share such a private moment? And I think on some sort of visceral level, even if you could recognize in another person that that was ordinary childhood behavior. I mean, if it's you and you're crying on the radio, I mean, that just, that would be kind of awkward and sort of uncomfortable, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can't know how somebody would react. Maybe she'd be happy to have been on the radio. You'll never know for sure. But yeah. Right. Now, do you think that this would have been different if Ira Glass would have had Molly Ringwald on her on the radio show and would have just had a conversation between the two of them about this um, experience of watching The Breakfast Club with her daughter. Absolutely. I think that would have made all the difference. I think the big issue with parental overshare is that it just, it's something about this, there's this very private moment that'll happen between a parent and a child that really only a parent would be privy to where the child sort of opens up in some way or cries or somehow emotional or confesses to something or anything where the child feels in a private situation. And then when that is broadcast, I think that's 
that's where the overshare happens. It's not that I think children should never be interviewed. I mean, it, it, it's debatable what the interest is in Molly Ringwald's child regardless, but um, I think that would be certainly less of a problem. Um, and I think that's true just when it comes to written articles as well about children. I think if a reporter comes in, even if a child's name is used and it brings up some ethical problems, but it's not quite the same where the parent is claiming the sort of ultimate authority and, and sort of privy to information that nobody else would be. Um, yeah, but in this case, right, um, presumably the kid was aware that there was a tape recorder there uh, and, and, that the, right. and that they're recording this for a reason. Does that make a difference if Muller Ringwald would have said, hey, you know, that radio show we listen to sometimes, uh, they wanted to do something about us watching this movie. Do you mind if I record it? Right. I think the issue there really is, um, I mean, I guess this is in a sense less bad than the sort of more common case where a parent who isn't a famous person has an ordinary experience or a not so ordinary experience with their kid and writes it up and that there was no sort of premonition that that was coming. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But I think here, I mean, can a 10 year old really consent in that way to being, to having your, I don't know. It just seems a little, a little iffy there. Um, But I think this does just bring up, yeah, a bigger question about sort of celebrities and um, parental overshare, Mm -hmm. because it seems like there's on the one hand, um, so Kristen Bell and some other um, sort of famous people um, are moving to they have some movement to stop the paparazzi from taking pictures of their kids. And I guess that's really getting somewhere. But then on the other hand, it's, you know, the celebrity child seems to be, um, it sells, I guess. Right. Even if it's someone like Molly Ringwald, who's not so much in the public eye right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting thinking about this issue because, um, you you know, it obviously um, forces us to, to, to consider what kind of privacy a person is owed. And, mm-hmm. um, and they're kind of competing goods here. I, I'm, you know, when you write about this on your blog, I'm, I'm generally sympathetic to, um, to, to your arguments in, in the, in the various cases that you point out, I suppose the, the devil's advocate position might be that parents are, uh, are already in this parenting culture where everything they do is under, um, intense scrutiny and they're, meant to coddle their kids in various ways. And uh, at at least by parents getting on a, you know, getting on one of the mommy blogs or the daddy blogs or parenting blog, or by, you know, Molly Ringwald sharing this story, she's perhaps not the best example, but um, they're in a sense putting out these problems that other people experience and that there is value in that, that other people um, might look at these situations and not be so alone as a parent and have kind of other examples of people going through similar things that, uh, they, they feel good that they're not the only one going through this, or perhaps they glean some wisdom, something, uh, to do that works or something, uh, to avoid that doesn't work. Uh, they think through the issue of parenting and that it's good as a society, uh, at least some degree to have kind of open discussions about child rearing and that this shouldn't be this kind of private cloistered world. Um, you know, it, it, you could, you could imagine going back, uh, to different times and places in history where raising children was more of a, uh, a communal affair and not something that happened, uh, in your little, uh, McMansion on your street, uh, behind closed doors all the time. Right. Well, absolutely. I think you're right that, um, this has become pretty much ubiquitous. Um, I used to try on my blog to keep track of instances of a parent saying something private about a child in print. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, it's exploded. You couldn't count this. It's just, you know, it's pretty much everywhere Mm -hmm. Um, on the radio and articles, you know, it's a ton. Um, And I think it really, um, yeah, I think that is pretty much the justification that's given for these, um, sorts of stories either it's a cute story and the idea is well who could possibly be upset by that or it's a more sort of sensitive topic and then if you object then it's clearly because you want there to be a taboo on 
whatever the issue happens to be right. that, you know, so if a child is, if a, a little boy is wearing a dress to school and the parent writes about that, and if you think that the child's privacy has been violated, then surely you must be incredibly transphobic or, you know, it's something like this where there's just, um, whether it's a serious story or sort of one of no consequence, there's always that sort of justification given. But I think I think the way to look at it is, let's say this were an adult, would you share equivalent information about a friend, about a sibling, um, about a coworker? You know, it just, it starts to seem as if parents are treating their children as, as just sort of appendages of themselves. And if they want to reveal something, they're willing to sort of risk whatever, it's not even exactly their reputation, but their privacy, they're willing to open up, but they haven't really considered their children as people who might want to decide what to open up about or not. Right. Um, um, so I guess that's, yeah. 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 It makes sense. Um, well, I will, I will look forward to future installments of parental overshare and, uh, oh, and, and there's, I'm sure there will be more. Yeah, yeah probably yeah. unfortunately. And, uh, maybe eventually. Oh, I actually, um, just have one question for you about uh -huh. parental overshare. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what you think about these stories. Like, um, I guess this was recently Justin Bieber, where it's somebody who, a video of them from when they were a child comes out because I'm not sure um, what I think of this. It's different from where a parent is sharing something, but where a video of somebody doing something offensive but not necessarily illegal as a as a minor comes out. Do you think that's um, and goes viral? I suppose. Do you, what, where do you stand on that? I don't know. Can you tell me? I didn't. I didn't see this uh, Justin Bieber thing. But oh, sorry. Tell me. Justin more about Bieber it. had. I guess used some racial slurs as an adolescent okay, and had been blackmailed with this. And then it somehow just came out. Huh. Um, but just in, in situations like this or with Mitt Romney, when his bullying came out years later, um, I guess I'm not sure that I object to that the same way as I object to parental overshare, but yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. I mean, with, I, I, I'm generally I'm generally against these kinds of things um, being lorded over people. If I were, um, you know, if I were the childhood classmate of Mitt Romney, or if I were the um, you know whoever had this Justin Bieber video, you know, I think certainly bla blackmailing him is wrong. Um, right. I, I don't think that I would have released this thing about Mitt Romney either. Um, you know, unless it. It would be different if it were part of some pattern that you could look at throughout his life and it was like another data point right. of this important thing to know. Of, but I don't think that, um, you know, nothing else I read about Mitt Romney uh, indicated that he was uh, a violent person or, or, right. or even that he had a bullying personality. You know, you read about George W. Bush and how he would come up with kind of derogatory nicknames for all of his mm -hmm. underlings and would kind of... Uh, have kind of like a frat boy personality. Um, right. And I, I never got the same thing from Mitt Romney. I don't think, uh, you know, it's impossible for me to to look at that story about R Mitt Romney and to think of him in the White House and to see any plausible um, connection or way that it would affect him being a leader. Um, and, you know, even I, I kind of objected on Twitter the other day to, uh, you know, Barack Obama was in, I think it was Belgium. He was in a hotel um workout facility and he was just doing like the most banal workout imaginable with weight machines and weights and uh someone in the same room had like you know sneakily taken out a cell phone camera and posted pictures of him exercising to the internet um and ultimately the washington post wrote an article and published the the little short video clips um to, to me if i was the washington post i wouldn't have done that and it, it might seem absurd to um, protect the privacy of the president who's under 24 hour scrutiny. But I think that even with the president, I would draw a line and say, um, there are some things that, that, uh, there's no reason, there's no news value in making this public. And when, when there's no, uh, news value in making it public, I think that the right call is to not violate the person's privacy. I think I agree with you on that. Yes. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Justin Bieber is there. I, I suppose Justin Bieber is a powerful person. Uh, and, 
there's maybe some logic behind um I think it, it connects. I think there may be more news value. It just seemed that he was, I'm not quite sure exactly how old, but he, it seems like he was quite young at the time. Right. And so the news, the value in the story, as I saw it, was more that it just shows the extent of racism in North America. You know, that's what it tells you. Um, right. As for what it tells you about him, I, I don't really know. Um, I don't know how his attitudes are these days. Yeah, yeah. Um... I don't know either. And, and it is, there is this constant struggle where, um, you know, you, you don't want to live in a society, or at least I don't, where any public moment or faux pas uh, is going to be broadcast to the entire nation, right? Um, right. At, at the same time, there are these problems that are invisible because no one really talks about them because they always kind of exist and happen in a private sphere. Um, and I think that you, I think this was you that, that had had, um, one possible solution to all of this at, at one point, which was um, more fiction, a kind of return uh, of fiction as a realm where we talk about current events and things that are going on, and uh, and maybe that would be a good thing. I think that would be great, and I would enjoy reading all that fiction too. Um, well, let's uh, let's move to the next topic, uh, and I want you to introduce this one because you recently traveled to Japan and wrote a little bit about it uh, and, and reflected on what it was like to be someone who couldn't pass in the society, unlike when you've traveled right. to other foreign countries. So uh, take it away. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yes. So I was recently in Japan um, on a sort of belated honeymoon. Um, and my previous travel experience had been mostly limited to France and at that mostly to Paris um, because I have a PhD in French and that was you know, where I was doing research and I also studied abroad there um, in college. And what I found in Paris was that everybody visiting Americans, probably British people, probably people from all over the world, sort of they want to pass as Parisian, as French. And because there's no sort of one um, ethnicity that's, I mean, Obviously, there are sort of extreme right people who would say otherwise, but there is no sort of one ethnicity, certainly in Paris, right. and everybody kind of has a shot, and then it becomes a sort of game um, for some tourists, but definitely for any for many people on study abroad or who sort of feel they're more a traveler than a tourist. Um, <coughs> it's this whole sort of game of trying to pass as a French person and um, with you know, it's obviously it helps if you know French, but even if you don't, you can have a scarf or an unfiltered cigarette or whatever it is that seems to sort of make the point. Um, but then what I found so interesting in Japan because of the ethnic homogeneity is that there was not a chance, no matter what I did, that I would pass as Japanese for even a moment. And I just thought that was a very different sort of travel experience where I wanted to, you know, be polite and, you know, follow the, whichever rules of etiquette. But I didn't feel like there was any sort of ambient pressure to convince people until I spoke, say, that I was Japanese because um, I had sort of deluded myself before going and thought, well, I'm sort of small and dark haired and maybe. <laughs> and then I got there and you could immediately tell who was right, yeah. East Asian, but not Japanese. It was. Um, yeah. So I thought that was um, an interesting experience um that i had also only ever really had before in a part of the netherlands where everybody was very blonde and um i'm not right you see <laughs> yeah well reading about your experience the first thing that that struck me um is that it would be a valuable thing if everyone experienced that at some point um you know i i studied in spain in college and so was in a country where I could plausibly pass uh, if I dressed the right way and uh, di didn't speak very much. Um, and uh, it, even in that situation, it, I certainly came home with a different appreciation of how hard it is to function and navigate in a country where you don't speak the language fluently. Um, you know, I, I, I looked at recent immigrants to the United States through completely different eyes 
um, and, you know, was sort of, uh, you know, I was never one of these people who was like furious in the grocery store that someone in front of them was like taking a long time or something. Um, but it definitely made me uh, a, a little bit more alert in, you know, if I was going around LA or something and I saw someone uh, who was having a hard time with some transaction, it occurred to me, oh, it's the language barrier and I could, you know, I, I could help out in some small way. Um, so uh, I, I would imagine that the outsider feeling um, that you had in, in Japan, if everybody could have a little bit of that, uh, I, I just can't help but think that we would live in a kind of more empathetic society and that some of the, um, some of the tension, or I guess maybe the lack of empathy that I see with regards to, uh, you know, immigrants in the United States would, would perhaps go away. Um, that could be, um, I think it's given, it, it took me quite a long time to get to Japan, um, having wanted to for basically my whole life. Yeah. So I think it's, uh -huh. It's unlikely that every American would <laughs> get to Japan, but at the same time, I think an experience like that could happen elsewhere. Oh, yeah. And I, I think, um, I mean, I really did feel on the one hand opposed to the sort of immigration policies that make a place so homogeneous, but at the same time, it did, um, it was both sort of freeing um, as a tourist to feel like there wasn't this whole game of trying to pass, but also... Um, it was just an interesting experience to be in a place where integration and acculturation, all this just, it couldn't sort of ever happen. I mean, I would always be a foreigner, even if I moved there and figured everything out. Um, so I, I guess I'm not sure it's entirely an applicable message for the States because I think, um, so what I, I think we've been seeing lately um, in a bunch of different um stories, um, some more tragic than others, is that sort of the definition of whiteness in the States is really expanding. Um, and we'll, this touches on some of the other topics we'll be getting to later, but um, pretty much anybody who isn't Black now maybe counts as white or will self-identify as white. And I feel like, um, I think the, me I think empathy is definitely you could maybe get an applicable lesson, but nothing quite like what happens if you're foreign in Japan happens if you're, I would say, a non-Black immigrant to the U.S. Um, and then it's a whole different, I mean, the whole racial politics are just quite different. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's all sorts of differences. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, I do think that there's something to be said, for, you know, if you were, say, um, if you're a white person in America who lived someplace that was mostly white, right? And uh, every so often uh, someone comes into your community or there is a person in your community who is of a different race. You know, it could be uh, that they're an immigrant from Asia. It could be that they're black, uh, but whatever they are, they're the only person of their race in a given room, right? Um, going to... Oh, then absolutely. For that case... Absolutely. Right. I mean, yeah. it, it, you, yeah. if you're in a place where you're the only one of a certain race, and, and if you've never experienced that, the first time you experience it is a kind of powerful thing. Right. And the way that it feels, even if you've thought about it intellectually, the way that it feels is something that you haven't been able to kind of know until that moment. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. And that that could be accomplished far, far closer to home um, than Japan. But um, yeah. Um, yeah, but that idea, I, I agree. That idea um, would probably um, make people less hostile to outsiders. Yeah, yeah. And to be clear, my, my pitch isn't for everyone going to Japan, but it is for everyone going somewhere uh, to some other country, and uh, preferably not like Britain or Australia. Um, to <laughs> right. you, you know, which isn't to say that there there aren't foreign experiences uh, that are valuable that, that one can have there, um, but. Uh, I, I think the less familiar and the more um, obviously out of place uh, you are, the better for, for purposes of, of what I'm talking about. Um, 
Oh, I, I think you're right. Um, and I would just make a case for that as well, just for the, um, to avoid the whole sort of tourist trap of wanting to pass as something that you clearly, I mean, even if you do pass as French, what's the point? The point is to see France and enjoy it and have a new experience, not to convince people you're some other nationality for the heck of it. Right. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about uh, a, a different topic. And that is the killing in Santa Barbara and the hashtag yes, all women. Uh, that was a response to it. Um, we've both written a, a little bit about this. My uh, contribution has been mostly to argue that we shouldn't automatically make mass killers famous by publishing their manifestos and putting their name and photograph all over the news. And that maybe, uh, although it's important to talk about the issues that are raised oftentimes, um, Maybe it would be better as a first step if we just decided that we weren't going to um, put their photographs in the newspaper or uh, or include their names. You know, people like this wouldn't have the incentive of knowing that they personally, with their name and photo, are going to be famous. And uh, you, uh, why don't you jump in and, and tell us what you've yeah, said about this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was very sympathetic to that argument, although I think I would sort of maybe come at it with kind of a compromise position where I think if a crime like this occurs, at least the name should be out there. Let's say you knew this person. It seems like it would come out also anyway with the internet. People are going to know who did it. Mm -hmm. But I thought that what I found really disturbing this in this round of um, extreme violence was that this this murderer's face was accompanying every single article. And it just for like, ever since this has happened, just it just creeps me out. And it also does seem like too much publicity. So it's one thing if his name and maybe his photo is with sort of the news stories about, you know, like a reported story saying what happened. But then I feel like all the sort of think pieces that come out a week later, and then, you know, there is his face again, and it just there's his name again. And it just seemed like, a bit much. And that's where I think the sort of celebrity aspect maybe comes into it more. Um, so I think it would be possible to maybe have the information out there, but not use him as sort of the visual. Um, yeah, if it, if it were up to and, me, yeah. I, I wouldn't literally suppress the name. I, I, you know, I would maybe have a norm where, um, you know, the police department releases it. Um, to anyone who asks. And, and, and I think actually for people who know the person, word is going to get to them anyway through kind of, um, you know, informal networks. Um, well, probably, yeah. But I think what I, I'm more interested in, you know, large national news organizations and what they do. Uh, is this person's name put in the New York Times and what are the costs and benefits of that? And I think that the costs uh, outweigh, outweigh the benefits. Um, that for, you know, 99% of New York Times readers, uh, the name of the person doesn't matter. Uh, it adds no value to the story. It adds no value to the conversation. Um, but that, uh, and, and you know, if, if I think that if national news outlets, um, you know, followed this, and obviously there are some uh, bloggers who aren't going to follow it. There are some people on Twitter who aren't going to follow it. But if it was kind of a general norm in the same way that, that uh, if, it, if it was respected to the same degree that the press doesn't report on the names of underage rape victims, right? Um, right. You can find those out if you try hard enough. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's generally respected and, and that changes the way that uh, most people treat this as a society. It changes the way that people who aren't in journalism behave on social media. Um, and mm -hmm. so... Um, but, but also, I don't want to just talk about, uh, the, this little piece of it. What, what did you make of the yes, all women hashtag, um, and, and uh, the well, kind of controversy yes. around it? Right, right. Um, so I had, um, a few different thoughts about this. Um, so on the one hand, I thought this was, I mean, so there have been a lot of stories, um, in the news really leading up to this and the, I would even say years leading up to this about um, sexual assault on college campuses and misogyny in general and street harassment and um, domestic violence and a whole range of issues that um, 
I'm really glad to see that there is now sort of a, some solidarity coming out of this sort of a voice against all of this. Um, and I really, really wish there'd been something, a movement like this um, when I was in college. Um, that said, I guess where I would have liked to see a little bit more is it seems like there's just this one narrative that there are these frustrated men who are unlucky in love and then there are women, like all women, who are just being chased by these men constantly. And the reality for women is a, quite a bit more complicated than that. You know, sometimes women are, you know, all it's true. Yes, all women are potential, if not actual, victims of you know, male violence and all of that. But many women are also frustrated in love and, you know, like people who don't like them back. And it's not just this sort of idealized woman who's just being, you know, constantly pursued, you know, and, and the same woman can be in both situations. Right, yeah. um, so something I've written about was um, when I was, you know, an adolescent, I was, you know, not particularly, um, I wouldn't have been recruited um, by any modeling agencies, let's say. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, the street harassment was probably the greatest. Um, when I was the least popular um, with the boys, I would have liked. So, um, yeah, I think these are sort of two experiences that many women have. And the way this discussion has played out, it seems like it kind of reduces women to just always being the sort of desired object of um, men's creepiness, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a more complicated story, um, and there was also an article in nerve.com that got at this um, as well, that basically um, a lot would come out of hearing the stories of women who are rejected, um, who, you know, are, um, whose interests aren't reciprocated, be both because it would sort of show that this doesn't have to lead to violence, and it would just make women seem sort of human, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, with regard to the, with the yes, all women hashtag, I, um, I was kind of up late the night that it started and put up something at the Atlantic, uh, the, the next day, basically just saying here, look, this is going on. And, uh, I found value in it. And I guess, I was interested to see if there was going to be a backlash to it, and there was. And I don't. To me, the value of that hashtag was just seeing a bunch of different people scattered all over the country talking about this thing that they don't usually talk about, and uh, affording people who don't experience it a, a peek into their lives, their experiences, their perceptions, and uh, and to the degree that they were hitting on problems to, to see. Uh, these problems that are again some often invisible, um, and, and I think that a lot of people who wrote against this hashtag, and it was mostly the kind of right blogosphere, um, painted it as something that was declaring that uh, all men were suspects, all men were violent, um, and I, I guess you know there were tweets like that, but. I think it's usually a mistake to to seize on to a hashtag like that, and they come up every now and then, and to try and and distill from you know what is surely like one twentieth of of all messages that any given person could possibly look at, right? To try and distill mm -hmm. a kind of overall narrative that it's pressing and it's tempting, right? Because you see these hashtags and you have your own kind of uh, political views and ideological views and uh it's very easy to map what's going on into some larger narrative where like this is what people are saying and this is why it's wrong uh, but in fact it's just a whole bunch of different people chipping in and, and like the hashtag obviously means very different things to different people and is used in different ways and to me the value in them is not that um that we're going to have one big single narrative that's going to rule this story. It's like, look at all these people saying this thing. Um, um, yeah, I, I see that to some extent. And that initially I had actually blogged 
and been completely wrong. I had said that I didn't think that this was going, unfortunately, that I thought this would not lead to a national conversation about nice guy behavior. And then lo and behold, that hashtag came out and then it almost seemed as if there was this conversation um, that I wouldn't have thought possible. Um, but I do think it does have its own narrative and it is one of women being, um, pursued isn't right because it's not about women being popular or something like that at all. I mean, it is about violence and this, this is all women. I mean, that's absolutely right. But I think it does, um, it does point, it, it sort of forgets about the women who have the same frustrations as this murderer, but who are not murderous, I suppose, because I didn't, I didn't read all of the hashtag by any means, yeah, yeah. you know, there are millions, but I don't remember anybody using it to say, yes, all women also get rejected like people who don't like them back. And, you know, yeah, well, and I, I, think I, I mean, I guess a little that 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 didn't seem to really play into it. But as, I mean, there's so many millions I could have missed it. Well, yeah, I, but I think that I don't know. I, I read your piece as like a response as much to the hashtag as to like people writing essays about the hashtag and people like discussing it. And I think you're right that people, um, you know, th there were lots of pieces about male entitlement to have uh, sex with women or, or uh, male feelings of loneliness. Uh, and you're right. I didn't see, I didn't see much to suggest uh, what is actually the reality that, that women too are, are frustrated and feel invisible to the other sex and that this is not a uniquely male experience, right? Um, I, I guess, but I, I don't know, I was, I was interested in the, the headline, the initial headline on my piece was something like, uh, after, a murder in, after a murder spree in Santa Barbara, um, women air grievances or something like that. And I got a lot of pushback on the headline, um, partly because people were bothered that it was uh, that that there was an echo of Seinfeld in the airing of grievances, um, right, right? Which I didn't didn't even occur to me at the time, uh, and I was kind of perplexed that that bothered people that they thought it was intentional, but um, but but also they thought that the kind of umbrella term airing grievances kind of diminished what. Uh, what people were talking about. And um, the, the reason that I chose those words, uh, airing grievances, was because the Yes All Women hashtag was doing so many different things. It was on one hand, you know, on one hand, people were complaining about being told to smile on the street, right? Uh, and then there were other people who were sharing their stories of being raped. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you sum up uh, a range of experiences that wide. Um, I guess the, the thing that the expression that people have been using a lot lately is rape culture. Yeah. And I think that's wrong. Which is supposed to encompass all of that. Yeah. And I think it, it is, it's, it gets at something true, but it ends up, you know, people who haven't read whichever article about the term are going to think, well, yeah, being told to smile on the street. Um, it's incredibly, <laughs> annoying but it's not rape you know and i i think it right that's the problem when a word has a meaning already and it gets um it gets used for something else yeah i think that i it, it struck me when i heard people uh using the umbrella term rape culture and also uh the kind of umbrella term misogyny right um there's certainly lots of things that people are talking about in this conversation that are misogynistic and there are some things that are um that deserve to be kind of bundled up with rape. Um, at the same time, there are lots of things that aren't that, right? There are lots of things that, um, you know, you could imagine, right, some 19 year old kid uh, who graduated from high school last year and is like working at his job and he's like walking down the street uh, in some big city and he comes across a woman and he tells her to smile, right? And uh, you can imagine that this guy uh, is, you know, very much opposed to rape culture and that, that he has, I suppose, although it's always, it's always older men who do that. Just, 
I don't think a nine do nineteen year olds tell women to smile. I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I've seen this like, uh, really? I've seen yeah. I've seen this before, uh, but really? but, it, but oh, it's not to okay. say like. But again, this world is like very invisible to me generally, and I don't generally see it, so I have no. Um, you're certainly in a better position than I am to know like what the norm is, um, but uh, I, I guess I would just say that um, to call it all rape culture, or to call it all misogyny, misses a lot of problematic behavior, and I think has the effect of um, I don't know. It, it has the effect of, of just like missing people who ought to take a look at their behavior and change it. Uh, even though they uh, are never going to rape someone, even though they hate rape, even though they have no inner hatred of women, still perhaps they're behaving in problematic ways. And uh, they're perhaps not going to be as attuned to that or reflect on it if they don't recognize, uh, you know, the possibility that anyone other than these terrible uh women haters with rage inside oh, them like the Santa Barbara killer, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Although I'm not sure misogyny, I think it's more just, it's sort of an unfamiliar term to a lot of people and it sounds very extreme, but I, what about sexism? Could that just cover what you're looking for um, to describe all of this? Um, or does that seem too sort of systematic, too much like workplace pay? I mean, it just, yeah, I, don't know. I definitely... I see how rape culture as a term definitely points to something very specific. And then when used as an umbrella term gets people confused right. and defensive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't know. I would just go with something like sexism maybe. Um, yeah. I think sexism fits better than anything else. Such about. Extremism. Uh -huh. I, th I think sexism definitely fits better than the other terms. Uh, and again, it does have uh, lots of connotations built in. Um, which, um, yeah, I don't know. I have to think about that more. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, I guess I, and I would also say one final thing that, um, reading through the S all women hashtag and some of the pieces that have come out after it, it's, it's almost impossible to, to not reach the conclusion that there's, uh, tons of problematic attitude or behavior and, and uh, lots of people with problematic attitudes. Uh, that deserve, you know, sustained attention. Um, at the same time, I think that there's a danger uh, of reading all of this coverage and coming away with the idea that uh, women are less safe than ever before. And, uh, and the, the numbers do not bear that out. Um, you know, rape uh, is down significantly uh, in like a, a trend that it, it's been going down significantly year after year for, I forget how many years, but like, uh, a pretty good amount of time. Um, and I think that, uh, well, I don't have statistics in front of me to tell you whether, uh, spousal abuse or domestic abuse is down. Uh, it certainly, it is a lot more frowned upon in culture and a lot more likely to be prosecuted when it comes up. Uh, so I think that like, significant strides have been made in a way that I don't think comes across in the coverage of the Santa Barbara killer that I've seen where, uh, well, I think that with the airing, when you say, when you talk about an airing of grievances, I think that's really what this is. It's not that these things have suddenly become worse problems. It's more that they just weren't discussed until now. So it could be that it's precisely because maybe some of these are less of a problem than they used to be that they can now be yeah. discussed. Well, I, cer I certainly think that's true, but I also think that, um, so, you know, comparing, comparing today to like 1990, right. Um, or 1995, it wasn't as if we didn't discuss rape in 1995. Um, but there are, I guess I don't really, maybe. Yeah. But there are like significantly yeah, fewer rapes today. Right. And I, and I think that this is important to raise only because, uh, to me, reading the coverage, you would get a different impression. And uh, and it's like a good thing that, that rape is down. And insofar as people are getting the impression that it's like um, more dangerous than ever to be a woman, uh, you know, it, it might be reassuring to realize, no, uh, it, it's actually not. It's safer than it was 
uh, 20 years ago, not less safe than it was 20 years ago, right? And significantly safer by the numbers. It's just like significantly yeah. safer. Yeah, I think if there can be a balance of these numbers and greater openness um, about what does go on, I think then that would sort of reach the best place. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about privilege, another topic that you uh, write a lot about. And, uh, and again, why don't you take the lead on this? Because uh, you've written so much smart stuff. Sure, about it. sure. And I will try not to say quite as much as I've written about it. Um, so yeah, several years ago, I noticed the expression, your privilege is showing, um, and then gave it the acronym on my blog, YPIS or YPIS. Um, and it just seemed to be everywhere online that people were telling one another that their privilege was showing. And then there, and this, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it at first. And then it seemed to go hand in hand with another phenomenon, which I called scrappiness one-upmanship, which would be where somebody who was um, like upper middle class in a setting where everybody was rich would complain about how poor they were or just where people would take sort of um, not to bring up Mitt Romney again, but sort of the um, ironing board as dinner table where people would take the one um, detail of their lives that made them sound sort of scrappy right. and use it to promote themselves. <laughs> and these two phenomena seem to relate to each other. But then um, just in the past sort of year or so, there have been all of these controversies around the word privilege where somebody will write an article um, denying their privilege or talking about privilege. And then this always starts with, then this will inspire some avalanche of discussion about privilege. And the word is just absolutely everywhere. And um, it's mostly used yeah, as an accusation. And then um, I wrote about it for The Atlantic in regards to um, this scandal where a Princeton freshman didn't want his privilege talked about, and now it's being talked about by far more people than he probably would have imagined. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so this Princeton freshman, um, his his story was basically um, that his grandparents were Holocaust survivors. Is this correct? Right. Right. So he seemed. It seemed like as many people do as I certainly did writing for my own college paper. He just, he was writing a, a college student op-ed and he kind of, he was sort of claiming that because people in his family had been not privileged, he himself couldn't be privileged. And it just seemed to miss how that word is used. Um, you know, it didn't quite add up. Um, and it just, it was very, um, it made him a very easy target for a lot of people to point out how sort of a fish in a barrel sort of situation, I guess. Yeah. You know, I, I was actually kind of, well, I don't know if I was more sympathetic to him than that. Uh, I, I would say I'm open to the possibility that we should be more sympathetic to him than that because, um, you know, his op-ed uh, does seem a little bit beside the point given the way that I see privilege used in, you know, thoughtful essays by my favorite writers who have written about the subject. But uh, it, it, it seems, it certainly seems plausible to me that privilege as used among his peers on Princeton's campus uh, is very different than that. And that within the context of that campus, um, you know, although that's not the way that perhaps uh, you and I understand the word privilege, that is how it is understood among his freshman peers at Princeton. Uh, that wouldn't all shock me because uh, as your blog demonstrates, lots of people use privilege in lots of different ways, some of them pretty highly suspect. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Um, actually, one of the most interesting things that somebody brought up um, then asked me after I wrote this article was um, whether my, and this was a friend of mine who blogs as Miss Self-Important, um, she wrote on her blog basically asking me whether the problem is privilege as an accusation um, or just the term, the whole concept of privilege. Mm -hmm. 
And my initial thought was that the problem is just this accusation, like what goes on at a college campus, what goes on on Tumblr or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then I think there is a problem with the term itself, even though it's pointing often to things that are very real and very important and that should be discussed more, mm -hmm. is that it's a word that it's again, it's one of these words that already comes with a meaning. And if you say that somebody comes from privilege or had a privileged upbringing, they're a rich person. And then I think people accused of, you know, a particular form of privilege right. who aren't rich kind of balk at that because it, you know, why are they being called privileged if they're not privileged, you know? Right. Um, so I think that these, these, the sort of higher use, like you're talking about, um, where people know what they're talking about and they're not um, trying to bully anybody and this sort of bullying use kind of converge though at the word being just sort of imprecise. Yeah, you know, um, I think that part of the kind of buried tension when we talk about privilege and the whole cultural debate around privilege, um, one of the unspoken arguments that's actually happening is how much ought we to focus on race uh, and to a lesser degree gender, right? Um, so I forget, I forget the name of the person who wrote the original article that made privilege uh, a kind of concept that... I think Peggy, Peggy McIntosh. Right, yeah, I think that that's right. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, you know, if you look at her original article, it includes examples of privilege, um, such as, uh, you know, I can do something uh, bad and not have it reflect on every one of my race, right? Um, right. Or... Uh, and, and you can think of various examples. There was an essay, I forget who wrote it. Um, I'm blanking on every name right now, but it, it was, it was, uh, it was someone who was black and was writing about a friend of his wanting him to help carry a TV through the city. Um, from Jamel. Yeah, Lee, yeah, it was Jamel. Or I may not be pronouncing yeah, yeah, no, that, but it yes. Him. Yes, I thought that was probably the finest use of the term. Yeah, it was and a fantastic. One of the sort of counter examples where I would think, well, it does obviously have um, yeah, I mean, invisible advantage is real. I guess what I wonder, though, is whether privilege, the term, has just become so loaded and so misused as to kind of... Right. Well, so, you know... Take away, yeah. So, you know, Jamel's essay, uh, for, for anyone who didn't read it, was basically, um, you know, he wanted someone to come with him to carry this TV through the city because he figured, uh, you know a young black male carrying a TV through the city is someone's going to stop him and like accuse him of stealing this TV, or at least that's like a very plausible outcome uh, that totally occurred to him. And that did not, if I'm remembering the essay, right, occur to his friend. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I think it is a really good example. I can, you know, if someone asked me to carry a TV six blocks through Venice um, from one house to another, I wouldn't think twice about doing it, and I wouldn't mm -hmm. imagine that anyone was going to accuse me of stealing the TV, even if I was, you know, dressed a, in the most casual clothing that I wear, that I own, right? Right. Well, I think it's very much like the yes, all women hashtag. I mean, it is pointing out things that if it's foreign to your experience, you would probably not think of. Right. Um, well, so... And I think that's, yeah. yeah. And so, so I, I think that this is, um, so, so in this sense, right? And in other senses, I think that privilege is a useful term, as, as I know that you do too. And uh, and I also agree with you that it's a pretty uh, suspect as as like a constant interpersonal accusation. Um, but but I guess what I would say is, so I, I wrote about this um, case at the Kennedy School of Government, uh, the the public policy graduate school at Harvard, and they uh, there were student activists there who wanted basically. Um, some kind of academic requirement around privilege. And um, they, I think, ultimately succeeded in getting something, though it's unclear exactly what to me, uh, as part of the orientation for students. Um, but the article that I was reading was talking about how one of the exercises that they did um, was, was something that is done on a lot of college campuses where like everyone lines up in a straight line. And then if you are uh, white, you take two steps ahead and if you came from a house where everyone went to college, you go another step ahead, right? Um, and it's, uh, so it's this exercise where it's like a very 
someone has made very particular judgments about how much race and class and gender ought to be emphasized, right? And um, and, and my kind of response to that uh, was, I, I find, even though I like I grant uh, the kinds of privilege we've been talking about, I find it faintly absurd to have a bunch of people in graduate school at Harvard uh, standing around deciding like who among us is the most privileged, right? Um, well, maybe if it were graduate school of poetry or something, but I think given the field, yeah, that's well, and, um, and it, yeah, and it seems yeah. and it seems like right if you really wanted to do the exercise right. And, and I don't want to say that that you know um, that a upper class. Uh, a person who was raised in the upper class and is white and is at Harvard shouldn't be attuned to the fact that they have privilege that they're like, you know, um, immigrant Asian classmate doesn't, or that they're like black classmate who was raised poor doesn't. Uh, I, I don't want to say that at all. What I do want to say though, is to make the exercise better, right. Um, both, both substantively better and maybe to, to make it more like healthy for all of the people involved, uh, uh, you know, whether they're black or white or, or Asian or something else, uh, the thing to do, right, would be to hire like a hundred um, unemployed Bostonians and to have them all gather at one end of the football field and then to say, okay, if you're a Harvard graduate student, take 100 steps that way, right? And then once they're at, yeah. once they're at the other side of the field, then have them do the like, okay, now you take two steps and you take one step and like, um, yeah. and this is this is the frustrating thing to me about the way that privilege is used and invoked in American discourse is that, that like it's almost always insanely privileged people nitpicking amongst one another about like small degrees of of privilege. Well, that's I think you're the point that you've made about um, I mean, the one thing with that Harvard, I think it's a there are times when um when there's sort of a there's earned and unearned advantage right and if some there are individual cases where somebody has more earned or not earned it but i think that's on the whole true and what i really like is when you talk about um how it's become really a class signaling conversation um that's who's having this conversation. Although, um, and I actually was just looking up um, some stuff about this and I saw um, somebody online was saying that they didn't think that was the case because they only heard about privilege when they got to college, which just seemed kind of like exactly the point. Um, it is, <laughs> right. it's something you learn <laughs> um, in college. And then I guess there were some people though, who, um, responded to my article to say that I was only looking at the privileged people having this conversation and ignore and sort of telling less privileged people, um, what they could or couldn't use in terms of terminology. And I guess, I think it's, even if it's the case that in every single subset of society privilege is used in this sort of academic way, which I, I really yeah, don't certainly think not, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even if that's the case, um, it just, if it, if it's already been so distorted where in, in the sort of halls of power, such as it is in the elite, then it's not helping raise awareness. Um, well, I, I, I guess I would respond the way, the way that I would respond to, to that person who uh, who made that criticism of you is just that um, the way to respect people and treat them equally as a journalist or as a public intellectual who deals with and writes about ideas um, is to treat them equally. Right. It is to give their ideas a full and respectful hearing. And if you find them wrongheaded in some way uh, to spell out why, and if you find them valuable to, uh, to highlight them and say why, right? Uh, it's, it's to treat them uh, as you would treat anyone. It is not to uh, sort of condescendingly defer to whatever it is that they happen to say based on their identity 
and to um, refrain from saying anything bad about them, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, anything critical about their ideas, um, and to uh, defer that, you know, that, that isn't to say that there aren't topics where it's appropriate to say uh, this person, given their knowledge and life experiences, is in a better position to um, opine on this particular phenomenon than me, right? Uh, that's totally valid. But I really dislike this idea of um, uh, of just kind of like taking certain categories of people and putting their ideas um, beyond criticism or treating them with kid gloves or like uh, no. The, I I see what you mean, but I don't I don't feel that that's actually. I feel like with this yippus, with the your privilege is showing, it's so often not a case of somebody who has had a particular experience educating somebody right. who doesn't have that identity. It's so often two people who don't have that identity yeah. or several speculating. And I think it just, if it, if it were only sort of the thing you say, it would be, um, it would still be problematic, but it wouldn't be quite as absurd, but um, yeah. It seems to just be a lot of sort of speaking for um, where there should be listening to um, and a lot of um, just and a lot of assumptions also about identity, especially when these conversations go on online. There's who knows who's what. And, you know, I remember I wish I could find where this link was, but there was somebody black online can who was accused of white privilege under some i don't even know which circumstances i mean because the, who knows um i think that's yeah my, my yeah i mean there are two issues yeah i think my personal um personally the, the most frustrating circumstance in which i'm accused of privilege and actually the one of the only circumstances uh in, in which i get this accusation bizarrely is uh, when I write about civil liberties, um, sometimes it'll be writing about victims of drone strikes in Yemen uh, or Pakistan, and sometimes it will be writing about, like, uh, there will be a, you know, I'll write about, like, stop and frisk, for example. And it'll use, it'll often be critical of President Obama when it's the drone program and Michael Bloomberg when it's the, uh, when it's stop and frisk, just because these are the prominent figures who are running these programs. Um, and... I'll get this response that's like, um, it shows your privilege that you can focus and write on these issues as opposed to, um, you know, getting health care for everyone. And uh, that's what President Obama is doing. And you're criticizing him. Um, well, it makes people feel bad or certain people. I think the people who don't feel bad when accused of privilege are exactly the ones who need that message and then don't, you know, it just, it seems to just channel things all the wrong way. Um, um, it, I think it's just meant to make you feel bad, you know? And I think um, having written a few articles now that get, you know, sort of a larger response than what I write on my own blog. I mean, I think a certain amount of the response is just sort of, about making the person who wrote the thing feel bad. And I think privilege has just become kind of a buzzword um, for doing that. And I'm not sure that there's even that much well, what, what, what gets of, me, an, of an argument. What gets me about it is just the, I, like, to me, and, and, and Glenn Greenwald has actually gotten this accusation and written and responded to it too. And I think that the point he makes is exactly the right one, which is, um, no, as Americans, in fact, the privilege that we are all demonstrating as Americans is, um, you know, raining down missiles on people in other countries and killing innocent people and not really uh, caring. And like, you know, basically, basically our approach to the drone war is that, um, yeah, this missile that we're trying to hit a bad guy with, it might kill a couple of innocent people, um, but that's worth it because it will, you know, slightly reduce the chance of some future terrorist attack in the United States. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I guess I don't really understand why, um, why writing about this topic would attract accusations of 
privilege. Um, I think that the... Um, is the implication that you couldn't personally have any concerns thus you're free to care about larger issues? Because I don't think that really adds up. I think Because who knows what your concerns are? That's sort of unrelated. Right. I think that that's part of it. I think part of it is like, um, I think part of it is, and this is aimed at, at Greenwald too. It's like, okay, Glenn Greenwald, Conor Friedersdorf, you have the luxury of criticizing the Obama administration on these issues because you're not reliant on the democratic coalitions um, on all of the things that it does for poor people in America. And uh, by undermining the coalition, that's what you're effectively doing. You're undermining all of these people. Um, so you should kind of give him a pass on uh, these civil liberties things because, um, you know, domestic politics or something, something like, that. I mean, I, you know, and again, I disagree with it. So, um, I don't think it's completely coherent. Maybe someone else would give a more defensible summary of it, uh, but that's that's my take on what it okay. seems to be. Um, I mean, it seems a strange requirement for every prominent journalist to be also very poor and able to speak from that position. I think there needs. I think what the best thing is just to increase the number of voices that get heard, you know, so fine. There should be somebody who relies on whichever particular benefit somebody wants to talk about, um, talking about that too. It shouldn't be, and then foreign policy isn't discussed. Right. There's definitely a huge class uh, problem in journalism. Um, and uh, I've, That's for yeah, sure. and I've actually, maybe we'll talk about this in a future episode because I've actually thought of a couple of ways to maybe address this, but um, but yeah, I'd be curious. We, yeah. we, and we actually, we have, um, we were going to talk about, uh, Ta-Nehisi's big reparations article and a couple other things, but I think we're out of time because, uh, oh, no. we're over an hour. Yes. I think you're right. Um, oh, wow. But, uh, but it was fun and let's, uh, let's do it again sometime and maybe we'll get to these other fascinating subjects. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye.